Good evening. There's one Yankee invasion that British Columbians love. The invasions which we call Hollywood North, worth $200 million a year, 4,000 jobs. And I'm told, and you're going to be told, that because of a plan of the tax department, the whole thing may be wiped out and the Yankees may be repelled, may flee south of the border to our loss. That's on the show tonight, and here's Steve with a rundown. Airline for sale. The federal Tories want to privatize Air Canada, but last year it was a money loser. Tonight, the chairman of Air Canada, Pierre Janiot. Part two of Native Land Claims. Tonight, the Nishka say 5,000 square miles on the north coast belong to them. In the studio with Webster, Rod Robinson, chief of the Nishka Tribal Council. In Hollywood North, the glitter is fading in British Columbia as American producers threaten to pull out if our federal tax collectors don't back off. A $200 million industry could be at stake. In the studio with Webster, three experts talk about the industry's uncertain future. And my three experts are in the following order. Richard Briggs of Walt Disney Pictures, impressive fellow from Walt Disney. Uh, Jimmy Westwell, who is a production controller for Televector Disc. And Diane Neufeld, who is from the BC Film Commission. Is it correct, Richard Briggs, that, as you say, in the past 10 years, you bought $50 million worth the business to Canada? Uh, that's correct. How did you do that? Well, we've just found Canada a very enjoyable place to work, and uh, most of the pictures that I've been involved with um, up here, just they, they were a fit. They were a natural fit. Walt Disney Pictures? Not all Walt Disney, no. What's the one you're making now? Uh, it's called Christmas Starts for the uh, Disney Sunday Night Movie. How much are you going to spend on that one? Uh, we will leave about a million and a half dollars behind. Now, are you suggesting to me, because of this tax problem, somebody wanting a share of the pie for the Canadian government, that you are in danger of pulling out of this country altogether? Uh, it's a large possibility. Uh, unfortunately, with the new U.S.-Canadian tax treaty, uh, they are asking us to tax 15 percent of uh, wages uh, earned by U.S. Uh, performers. Um, and uh, that's 15 percent that they may not have to pay if they were doing the same picture in the United States. Uh, and that's just the withholding part of it. In fact, we could be liable for the full tax, which could be as, as much as 65 percent. Most of our pictures are, are, are put together based on a performer or a star. And if that performer is going to have to pay 65 percent of his wages here in Canada, he probably won't come. Mind you, you don't bring up millions. Well, mind you, we've had Katherine Hepburn, Betsy Davis, Raymond Burr, Burt Reynolds. He's here right now. Right now. And, and if they were going to be taxed at 65 percent, they would say, keep Canada. It's very likely they may go home or not come. Now, Jimmy Westwald, you tell me the kind of implications of what this industry does for our economy and our film. Well, as you said when we opened, there's a $200 million industry of which $60 million a year is paid in payroll taxes, is, in, is wages. Mostly to Canadians. Mostly to Canadians, on which the average rate is 40 percent. Now, for 15 percent of a star's wage, they're going to throw away 40% of $60 million a year. That's just in B.C. Mind you, why should Americans have an edge? If I'm here in this country, I've got to pay my full share of taxes. I'll tell you why. It's imported capital. It, does not, it should not be taxed. It's brought in from out of country. It's not the Rolling Stones taking money out. So it's, it's not being the of the $60 million wages. We have another $150 million in expenditures here. That's correct. Diane, how does the B.C. Film Commission feel about this? Are you shattered, shocked, stunned, appalled? Well... <laughs> Yes, yes, and yes. If we have spent the energy that, that we've spent in the last few years making these uh, great leaps and growth of industry, it's uh, really going to be disappointing if we have to go out of business, which is what we'll be doing. Did you know this was coming? Well, it was, I think, penned in 1980, but enacted in January 186. Since then, we've all been actively lobbying, trying to get the attention of Revenue Canada to suggest other ways of interpreting the regulations to the Act, because it's very broad. It just says um, tax foreigners, you know, David Bowie or, or someone on a film, it doesn't matter now, what. Now, if it was just a 15 percent withholding tax, which you were able to claim on your American income, that would be fair, wouldn't it? Well, the problem is, though, that most performers in the United States have their own corporations. Uh, then they are put as what's called a loan-out corporation. They loan themselves out to their own corporation. Their tax could be considerably less than that based on their, whatever the corporate right. entity is. So, in fact, they may pay no tax in the United States. Now, I'm not going to argue whether that's fair or not. Uh, but that's what they're entitled to. 
take the benefit of the tax laws in the states. That's correct. Meanwhile, we bring in this in with the possibility of a total Canadian income tax on all monies earned in this country. That all monies earned for services performed in this country. So if they do the entire picture up here, Revenue Canada is suggesting that we could be liable for a full 65% of their income. And if you're talking the Burt Reynolds of the world, you can be talking three or four or five million dollar players. Or a Michael J. Fox, who just recently won an Emmy, who is a local person here. Uh, God forbid he'd want to come, come back home and do a picture and say, well, fine, I'll do a picture for $3 million and leave 65% of it here. Have any companies yet pulled out or said they're going to pull out? Viacom has decided not to shoot here because Raymond Burr can't afford to pay Canadian taxes. Viacom? Viacom. Were they shooting at the moment? They, they are, they've moved to the States to do their next Perry Mason. They just did one in Ontario. How many f films have we got? So Raymond Burr says, no, I can't afford this American... This Canadian tax deal, I'm going to get out. I won't that's, shoot again. That's right, and without Raymond Burr, there's no Perry Mason. How about you? Any others going to pull out that you know of right now? Um, not definite titles, but at least half a dozen companies that said have said, we, we like being there, but we can't come back. We're not coming to shoot movies while you're shooting yourself in the foot. And what about the government position? Have you not used politicians to to fight for this vital industry for hard-pressed British Columbia? Well, I don't have audience in the rooms where they talk, but I'm told that, that it has finally made it onto provincial federal discussion agendas. And of course, the communications that we've been sending out from the industry and from our clients have been, please come and talk to us. It's different in BC than it is in Eastern Canada. We depend on these American clients, and we'd like you to hear them. When we, didn't we have some fancy scheme to spend a few million bucks in that old ironworks down at Boundary Road? What's it called? Dominion Bridge? Yep. Well, it's an un BC DC has scooped it and uh, put out tender for proposal. They're now reviewing the proposals. In other words, we, if, if this sticks, would yep. you have any need for any fancy studio facilities in Canada? We always, uh, always are in need of a studio. Um, again, the problem is if we don't have a performer to be in the movie, we won't need one. You're deadly serious about this? Deadly serious. How many of your colleagues are that deadly serious? Most of them. And I mean, I've, I have enjoyed making films up here for a long time, and I would hate to see the industry go away. Uh, it's a little like someone bringing you a loaf of bread and saying, I'd like you, like you to share the bread with you. Uh, the other person says, that's what's wonderful, but I'm going to charge you 25 cents for the privilege to, to, to eat that bread. Were you, in fact, enticed up here by the possibility of two things? One. The rate on the Canadian dollar was wonderful. You got a buck thirty-six and a buck forty for every dollar you brought into the country. That's one thing, isn't right. it? Right. That's correct. And the other thing was the tax incentive in that you you didn't even pay the fifteen percent withholding. No, we, we in the states we didn't, and we used to have in the states what was called an income tax credit, uh, which basically reduced your your net profit. But that's gone with our tax revisions. So we've lost a major tax incentive in the United States, and just at a time when Canada should be wooing uh, U.S. producers up here, it's like, wait a minute, now we've got this Canadian tax to deal with. Uh, but just a minute, did you not normally, if I were an American technician or two-bit star or something, would I have a 15% deduction from my check in this country? In the past, no. Yeah. No, none at all. None. So you've been hit with a double whammy, well, we tightening up of the U.S. tax laws and Canada coming after you for potentially total tax on your income made in this country. That's correct. And of course, we don't recognize uh, some other tax categories where, where you can dodge things in the States and get nailed as individuals here. That's the loan out, the loan out corporations, yes, they don't All recognize right, now, those. what about, what will happen? Who will suffer apart from we'll lose the Americans and we we'll, won't see Granville Street in the movies anymore, which may or may not be a loss, but... Uh, what will be the effect on the industry in British Columbia, these 4,000 people? No work. They'll be on welfare. The government can pay them to stay home. That's their alternative. You mean to say without the Americans, we can't have a film industry? We're 95% American here. That's the bottom line. All my clients are American. Well, you, well you'll manage to stave off welfare, wouldn't you? You'll have to go to Toronto and work. I don't want to go to Toronto. That's worse than anywhere. <laughs> How about it, Dan? It looks black. <clears throat> it does look black. Um, I think that it unfortunately um, also plays into the east-west dilemma that we always have that British Columbians for some reason don't have as convincing a voice in the east. Well of course that's a common you know. problem. When we make a decision? We're, we're in the process of making collective decisions right now. Unfortunately for us when we when we plan a film as to where we're going to shoot it we do that several months in advance so we are now preparing for films that we may be shooting here in the spring. How many? Three features. Starting? 
<laughs> well, we haven't. Those, we haven't got those started. deals aren't put together yet. Anyway, you're going to plan them while this tax double bite is over your head. Well, we're still trying, but it, it looms larger and larger. And unfortunately, depending on the individual project and the star that we try to attach to it, he may say, I'm not interested in coming here, so we may not be able to bring the project in. Well, I hope the politicians listen to you. The tax men won't, but the politicians might. Well, we, we certainly hope so. I think it's a very viable industry, and uh, people have worked very hard here to make it one. And you like us, but you don't want us to tax you. Well, we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to share in the wealth. I'm glad we got the story. 4,000 jobs threatened. My thanks to Jimmy Westwell, Dan Neufeld, and Richard Briggs, Walt Disney Pictures. Thank you, Thank Dan. You. Next, Air Canada, Pierre Géniaux. We're going to have a look and try and find out how our airline is being run. And I'm talking about Air Canada. And with me is Pierre Géniaux, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer. And my first question, Mr. Géniaux, is my employee, is how come you made... What was it? 28 million in 1984, and you had a loss in 1985. What went wrong? It was a tough year. We had uh, we had costs increasing rapidly in the uh, in the whole industry. Uh, extensive competition. We had too much capacity in Canada. Too many price wars. Uh, well, costs were uh, were increasing too rapidly. The whole industry in Canada has been in. Uh, has had some difficult times. Uh, Too many price wars. You don't want price wars. You'd like to go back to good old days when Air Canada had its monopoly back and forward across the country and no, you didn't even know to compete not. with CPA. Cer certainly not. We, uh, it's, it's a question of, of, uh, of how many one should have, really. If you, if you always sell below cost, it's all right to sell below cost at specific times, just to clear the warehouse kind of thing. And this is how seat sales originated, you know. But when it becomes a continuous a continuous action, then it's uh, then uh, then you really end up producing below cost. If I'm paying full economy fare and there's a guy here at one third of the price, I tend to get a little bit upset. Yes, but you're buying something different. When you're buying the full price, you're buying the convenience of a scheduled airline. You're buying the fact that that airline is going to be there in November and uh, on the dull days uh, when there are no customers. You're buying dependability, and that's what scheduled service is all about. You can't be expecting to buy that for the same price as a charter operator, which operates only when it's full. Uh, tell me about deregulation. When I see what's happening in the States, I get worried about deregulation, and you'll probably like this worry, because I think that deregulation uh, makes you go into too much economy. Safety could well be affected. Am I right or am I wrong? No credible airline will ever touch safety. I can't believe that a credible airline will even consider that, because that's what we depend on. We depend on the, the, the security of the mind of our customers. But when you have many newcomers, I suppose in the business, some people have less experience than others. How but about what has deregulation done to you up to now, in fact? It's forced you to change your whole tactics, hasn't it? Well, yes, it has, uh, it has modified the structure of the industry, there's no doubt. The deregulation brought about the pressure of increased competition, and, uh, and I think it's turning out to be a little different than some, some of the purists had thought uh, of the vision of uh, a multiplicity of airlines, and that's how it started in the States, and perhaps a little bit that way in Canada, too. But if you're going to let the market decide, there are going to be winners and losers. And what we're seeing today is an increase in concentration, certainly in the United States. Well, look at your own airline. All of a sudden, you're dumping some of your local services, are you not? We are restructuring in order to make sure that it's more, it's more economically served. Restructuring means that you're trying to get rid of the unprofitable links and give them to somebody else, like Air Ontario. Well, in, in the case of some of those stations, they were better served. You see, here's, if, if you have a market which is 100 passengers a day, mm -hmm. you can only offer that market one DC-9. If you use a small airplane, you can offer several frequencies to that market. So let somebody else do it. Let somebody else do it, but in cooperation with Air Canada, because the people in the smaller communities really remain plugged into the large Air Canada market and are still part of our international network. But as and a man who wants to make money, surely your concentration now is to get all the money-making links you can get. For instance, you want to invade Canadian Pacific's market into the Southeast Asia, don't you? Well, I think uh, the, uh, the Pacific is the growing area of Canada, and we believe that looking down the road that Air Canada should also be present on the Pacific, uh, the same way as uh, Canadian Pacific Airlines is present on the Atlantic. And, uh, Mind you, they don't get into London. 
but they get into uh, Amsterdam, and through Amsterdam, they penetrate the UK market. This is all fair game. Well, and, and the Canadian Pacific has said you're making a sneaky attack through the back door. How can we Bombay, be sneaky when Singapore. we're so much up front as we are? I yeah. mean, we just state what we, what what we think we should do. What do you really want to get into the Far East Korea you want? Uh, Korea is an interesting uh, c uh, nation which is increasing in trade with Canada and, uh, and the trades of relationship. But one day, the day will come where there may be a second Canadian Airlines allowed in Japan, like there is a second Canadian Airline uh, uh, that, that has permission to operate to UK today. Mm -hmm. And so why not Air Canada? Uh, Look, before I forget, one thing that always haunts me as a Westerner, and, uh, you know, is that Mirabel Airport. That's one of the greatest wastes of money in the airline business we have ever seen, isn't it? And do you want to fly into Mirabel, or are you told you've got to use Mirabel? Well, the, the airport exists, and it exists as a designated international airport for the Montreal area, and so it is to be used by all the airlines. But it is a difficult problem because the airplane, the airport was built, as you know, at the time that uh, the forecasts were for far greater volumes than there is today or there turned out to be. And so, uh, literally, the government of the day finished up with two airports. And, and we uh, only need one? Well, one would be enough. One would be enough, yes. Which one would you pick? <laughs> I thought I've already got into enough trouble with that one. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm worried about your battle with the United Kingdom. You've got what they call fifth freedom rights, haven't you? And they want you to, they want you, <clears throat> they're mad about the numbers of passengers you're picking up. Now, if you break up the deal with uh, with the UK, we'd be in trouble. We'd lose British Air and somebody else flying into Vancouver, wouldn't we? Well, to start with, let's let's just take two seconds to talk about what an air agreement is. It's essentially uh, an authorization by each party to penetrate some markets, to have access to some markets. Back in 1978-79, British Airways uh, or Britain wanted to have access to the then considered very rich Western Canada market. In return, they had nothing to offer except because we already had access to Britain, mm -hmm. and they wanted, so they offered at that time, and we finally made a deal to have access in a very limited fashion to markets in the, in the UK for, for India and Singapore. And it was extremely limited because we were, we were allowed only a few frequencies, a few flights, and it was never a question of what percentage should be fifth freedom or not. Right. So really what you're trading here, it's a trade agreement. You're trading access to markets. You are allowing the Brits to sell seats made in Britain or airline seats made in Britain into Canada and they were allowing us to sell Canadian goods, Canadian services in Britain. At that time, in fact, we were very much against the deal because it was lopsided. It was, a, it was about four to one. The value of the market that the, air, that the British Airways was getting access to was considered about four times the value of the, of the markets that we were getting in UK. What happens four years later? They are unhappy about the deal because it didn't penetrate the market. It's their own business. They have to be commercial they failed. about it. They oh. failed. We, by, by contrast, have been successful in the market, and now they say we want to renegotiate the deal. It couldn't mean that you would leave Heathrow, could it? Certainly, I hope not. But, at, uh, but in this game, uh, I guess they're playing hardball by saying unless we come to an agreement, we'll, uh, we won't allow you to come to UK. Listen, how's the morale on Air Canada's staff, Air and Ground staff? You've done a lot of trimming, a lot of fairly brutal little golden handshakes here and there. Have you finished trimming? Well, I wouldn't, first of all, I wouldn't call it, it brutal. Everything has been very gentle, I think, and there hasn't been anybody that has been pushed out. But people have been helped and eased, and I think we have a much leaner organization today. And I think we are, uh, we are doing very well in terms of, uh, of our fighting trim. I'll remind you that last year we won the trophy of being the best customer service airline in the world, which is no mean feat. And we had won the Technical Services Award a couple of years before that. So actually, we've got a, an, excellent, an excellent group rolling, and we're very competitive. You finished trimming. I think you always have to look at being more efficient. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. More with the Pierre Genial. I haven't even mentioned privatization, whatever that means. And I'm going to take calls to the president and CEO of Canada's flagship airline after the break. <laughs> Mind you, one thing deregulation has done was that it gave Ward Air scheduled flights into Toronto and Ottawa? Yes, well, across the, across the, the country, actually, wherever they want to go, there's no limitation to Ward, like there's no limitation to any other carriers. Everybody can be a Transcon carrier today. And their fares are cheaper than yours? In some cases, uh, but there's good match. Uh, you don't mind that at all? 
Well, we, we all end up matching. We? We're not quite the same product. We offer different but frequencies. We offer a lot more choice to the, to the business will you people. Make, will you make a profit this year? Yeah, there's a fairly good chance that we will. We, are, we have rebounded rather well in the second half of this year. Is it possible to sell Air Canada? The government is committed in certain areas, not yet formally in Air Canada, to privatization, which means to get rid of all or part of it. What is your view on privatization? Well, I think we have to we have to look at it from the point of view of uh, and the, and the question hasn't been answered yet uh, by the government by the government. No, but, I but realize you have to look that. at it from the point of view of deregulation on one hand, and wondering whether in a deregulated environment, having the largest airline in this country sort of regulated through its ownership, whether that's a paradox or totally compatible with a deregulated environment. But the second and perhaps more important question is what what do you do about equity needs of the corporation? You mean money to make it expand? Uh, m money to make it expand. A, a, a private corporation every now and then can go to the marketplace to raise equity. Right. Right. Canada hasn't had any equity change since 1976. That's a long time and when you look down the road at growth plan, expansion plan and renewal plan, uh, it's quite normal to envisage a need for additional equity. Now the government who doesn't need, who doesn't have much money these days and we all know that, uh, he's not very anxious to uh, invest in any crown corporation. So the question really is, how do you how do you how do you uh, enable a crown corporation like Air Canada, who is commercially involved, to grow? And and uh, and uh, the suggestion is, in my view, less privatization than is it is the time come to enable the public to participate with the government in that? You mean uh, buy shares in Air Canada? Buy shares, just in Air like Canada. British Air did. Yes, well, or, or they haven't done it yet. They've been talking about doing it. But in other words, only by that, by investment in shares of Air Canada, would you have enough leverage for your equity capital and you'll need to replace all your DC-9s, etc. down the road? Well, down the road, equipment replacement requires uh, probably to raise some capital, yes. You must have hundreds of millions on the drawing board to spend on new aircraft. Several billions of dollars, I would say, when I look at the next uh, five, uh, well, in, in five to ten years from now, at least uh, three billion dollars that, uh, that will need to be identified. Let's go to the phones. I don't know if these will be travelers or critics of policy. Go ahead, please. Yes. Hello? Have you a question for Pierre Genio? I do that. Uh, recently, there was an announcement made that the Canadian government had allotted uh, an amount of $250,000 or so for promotion from two places abroad. And this money was given to Canadian Pacific Airways Airlines for promotions out of Italy, I believe, and New Zealand. Now, how can that be justified? I mean, Air Canada is the Canadian flag carrier. It's supported by government. How possibly can it be rationalized to give this money to a private carrier? I saw the item. Have you any comment on it at all, Mr. Genio? Well, I think the only comment I have is that uh, both all airlines in Canada have been working uh, have been working with uh, tourism departments and have done joint promotions, and have received some money from. Uh, now, I think it uh, matters less whether where the national carrier or the other ones are. They're also bringing tourism in Canada, and I think we need to all work together to increase tourism to this country. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, I, I support uh, Pierre 100% on uh, selling shares in Air Canada. I think the uh, public should have a, dire a direct benefit in the air carrier, but I think the government should still have a, a major share in the... In, the uh, in other words, you don't believe in privatization of the airline into the hands of uh, free enterprises? Not, no, not, not Air Canada. I, I, think, I think Canada should have a, a flag-carrying airline. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. As you know, I was wondering, um, if Air Canada did privatize, would you be able to compete with the other airlines? And also, it seems that Pacific, uh, Canadian Pacific is quite upset with the idea of you moving into the Pacific Rim countries when they have a strong foothold. And I think what makes it even more upsetting is that it's a government-run Crown Corporation, and it's and it's defeating private enterprise by taking trying to take a hold of uh, something that is very profitable for CP right now. Uh, I'd just like to know how you feel about that. You're taking unfair advantage of competing against a Vancouver-based major airline, which doesn't want you to gnaw away at its roots. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, we would want to we would want to be more complimentary than. Uh, 
than necessary competing to the same area. There's lots of foreign competition out there, and I, and I agree with that. I think the key and carriers have to work closer together. Uh, but uh, looking at the Pacific Rim and its importance to Canada, I think down the road, uh, the same way as we have several Canadian carriers on the Atlantic, uh, the market would be big enough and, uh, and the, uh, the ball games out there are big enough to have a couple of Canadian carriers, which are both uh, working actively to earn money for Canada. Go ahead from uh, Kelowna. Good afternoon, Jack. Good afternoon. Yeah, hi, Pierre. I'd just like to ask, I don't know, maybe a simple, maybe a difficult question, in the fact that I work overseas, I buy my tickets out of Calgary for $2,200, Air Canada, and that buys me a return trip to my destination and back. Now, if I buy my tickets overseas, in Libya, I pay $900 U.S., and I fly the same carriers. I'll hang up and wait for a response. No, no, don't hang up. Don't hang up. You work in Libya, and you're telling me in Calgary you've got to pay 2200 Canadian for a return trip. That's a, 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 be a three-month or a six-month ticket. It's not an excursion. And you can get back for $900 U.S. buying it. Well, obviously, you're going to buy in Libya. I am now, but before, I always used to buy them through Air Canada. What the devil is that? <clears throat> well, there are some odd deals around this world, but it's, it's most unusual, I would say. Uh, there are sometimes some differences because of currency fluctuations, and they're not adjusted immediately. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, there, there are some, sometimes some very, odd, uh, some very odd prices that exist out there. But mind you, he's not flying Air Canada all the way. You don't go into Libya, do No, you? no, we don't go to Libya. He's flying it from somewhere in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Who do you fly with out of Libya? Well, I fly, well, Libyan Arab Airlines now. And where do they take you? They either take me to Frankfurt or uh, Heathrow. Fair enough. Well, that must be their link, which is subsidized so heavily. Eh? Yeah. And yeah. I fly either back on uh, Lufthansa from Frankfurt or Air Canada out Good. of London to Toronto. Got the point. Thanks very much. Interesting, though, isn't it? <laughs> no wonder the tic your ticket operators nearly go crazy trying to I, work I out agree. the best There's fares for people. There's thousands of prices out there. Go ahead from Seashelt. Yes, Air Canada will never be able to compete as long as they treat their passengers in the, in the way that they do, especially their first-class passengers. Uh, uh, recently, well, a year and a few months ago, I uh, flew from Ottawa to Vancouver, full fare, uh, first class, uh, two passengers, $1,300 it cost me one way for two people. I paid for it in, in advance. I was told that uh, I could take a cat with me, in the first class cabin. Uh, it turned out, first of all, there's no special check-in, whereas the CP Air passengers were merrily being greeted with big smiles. Uh, I had to wait in line at one line, and then the girl closed the wicket, and I had to go to another one. Was this Ottawa to Vancouver? That's in Ottawa, from, uh, from Ottawa to Vancouver. Just a minute. Can, can she take a cat in first class? I've never had of that. I, I, uh... Well, I was told I could. Well, as it turned out, uh, first of all, no special check-in. All right, you wait in line, and then you have to go to another line because she closes the wicket. CP Air people who, who have their first-class tickets are getting special check-ins. Then it's $40 extra for the cat, uh, 1995 plus tax for the cage. I already had an Air Canada cage, but it apparently was out of date. It was two years old. Uh, there was no choice in food. Uh, this is the first time I ever flew uh, first class, and I was going to treat. Okay, I, I think if, I think he's got your complaint now. Yeah. How do you plead to this child? Well, let, Mr. let me Genio. first apologize if, if uh, the impression you had of our service is uh, is as bad <coughs> as that. But uh, uh, Ottawa is an airport uh, has been under construction, and uh, and it's not uh, it's not been as well as we had hoped it to be. But let, let me say that uh, that uh, our people are extremely professional. They do a tremendous job. And as I was saying to Mr. Webster a few minutes ago, we, uh, we in fact, were recognized by the World Airlines uh, community last year as the best customer service airline. So uh, I, I think we do it right uh, well, once, why once in no a while. Food in Hold on, my dear. Right. <laughs> let me put it this way, because she'll go on forever. Why did you write to somebody and complain? Well, I was right in the midst of writing a letter to Mr. Genio. Right. Uh, well, uh, please make sure he gets it. He'll be getting my letter. Well, Good. Well, please do. And Watch I, for the letter about the cat. I will look for it. 
I am sufficiently masochistic to stand for some more questions. I'd oh, like yeah, to sure. see Big Shots getting a little <laughs> needle now and again. That's all right. After the break. <laughs> Piaget, how long have you been president and CEO of Air Canada, Piaget? A little over two years, two and a half. Do you, are you appointed for a term or are you there no, at the no, pleasure? No, I'm at the pleasure of the Queen. Pleasure of the Queen. If she doesn't like you, she tells you to get the hell out. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, that's fair. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, Mr. Genot. I was wondering if uh, you were going to be uh, with the regulation and everything. I was wondering if you were going to be in a position to be hiring in the near future or if you were going to be. Uh, um, laying people off. I'm a commercial pilot, and of course I have vested interest in this, and I was wondering if you were going to be, uh, of course, when Air Canada hires, it's a domino effect. And I was wondering what your future was going to be holding for you. The industry in Canada, the, the market in Canada is not growing very much uh, these days, uh, so uh, as every airline attempts to be that much more efficient, I think the hiring was still going to be fairly lean for some time. I would, I would hope that in about a, a year from now, there might be a bit of a pickup, but, uh, but right now, and particularly in the winter, um, the volumes are down. So he hasn't got much hope of getting a, even from the domino effect, getting a right. job through people being hired by you. Well, there is some growth going on in the third, in the local carriers. That's where the growth is right now with the, with the smaller airlines, with the Air BCs and the Time Airs and the Air Ontarios and the Air Novas and the Air Maritimes. The smaller carriers are growing right now in Canada, the tiny ones. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Genot, what is the actual value of having Air Canada, and for that matter, possibly Canadian National Railways, to be maintained as a pacer. In other words, in some industries, the company keeps a company truck to pace the hired trucks, thereby ensuring fair value for the money spent. And secondly, does this in fact, uh, in Canada, uh, is this a better situation than in the United States where they don't have a pacer? Well, that's that's uh, that's entirely, I think, a function of what uh, of, uh, of what the government might want to do. Far be it for uh, me for being stupid. I don't know what he's talking about. Well, you have a control well, and experimental situation. So the, the 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 country has has Air Canada, which acts as oh. a pacer. It serves as competition, but it also keeps down the cost from uh, private companies. Yeah, I see. I, I think, see the point he's making. Yes, I think the uh, the point is that there are pros and cons to that. There are some people who would argue that because we're government owned, uh, we may not be able to keep the cost as much down as as a private enterprise who can be uh, uh, more ruthless with its approach to business than, than the Crown Corporation is expected to be. So there's a bit of both. Uh, it depends whether uh, a country wants to have a window in an industry. It provides provides that kind of a thing. But also, uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it has been, in the past, an instrument of development, not just in this country, but also internationally. I think this was one of the points that uh, is inherent in my question. Good, thank you. That was a pretty esoteric question. Go ahead, please. Oh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Just uh, wanted your comment on something. We were talking about uh, Air Canada wanting into uh, the Pacific Rim mm -hmm. and um, wanting routes in that area. And just wanted if you if you think it's really fair that they're fighting for this area when years and years ago and routes were being awarded, you know, Canadian Pacific were given South America and the Pacific Rim, Australia, and Air Canada was given London and Paris, and it just seemed that at that time CPR was sort of thrown the crumbs. I mean, years ago, who would have thought of people flocking to South America and flocking to... Well, I think it was worse than that. I think Gordon McGregor refused to express any interest in the route across the Pacific. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> but, I, I, I mean, I, that's I, old I, hat now. <laughs> You've made it quite clear. This area is becoming popular. Well, just a minute. You don't want any of CPS groups. You, all you want to do is to try and get, break the monopoly on Pacific routes, and you'd like to go into... Seoul, Seoul, Jakarta, Taipei, Manila, Osaka, and Kuala Lumpur, right? Yeah, I think the question is whether or not the Pacific Rim has grown to the stage where a second carrying carrier could be there, not in, comp in competition with the current one, but, uh, but to participate in the market as well. You uh, think there's room for both of you? I think in times there is room for both of us, yeah. Fair enough. Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, I happen to be an Air Canada fan. I've been traveling Air Canada for 15 years. I'm a commercial traveler. Thank you. And what really cheeses me off about Air Canada is that when I fly to Saskatchewan now, which 
$451 to Saskatoon on a dinner flight. And what do I get? I get a croissant and ham or a bun with roast beef in it. And that, for those prices, I think we're entitled to a better dinner than that. Well, I suppose so. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, I oh, sorry. 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 <laughs> Maybe it's run up his dinner. <laughs> Four hundred and fifty. Actually, uh, actually, it, it depends. I mean, we've got all kinds of taste in people. We've been people that have been telling us that uh, the, that they want the snack rather than the than dinner. the full meal, and uh, so we're trying to have as much variety as we can. Go ahead, please. Yeah, as a consumer, I'm worried about the safety factor when I hear about a company tightening their belt. I was wondering if he could uh, ease my mind, any. Well, let me tell you, uh, madam, that uh, that last year, uh, or <coughs> when uh, when the uh, the year was actually a pretty disastrous one for the industry because uh, we've had a number of spectacular problems that, uh, fortunately, Canada was spared and Air Canada was spared, uh, but there were a number of spectacular accidents that we increased our level of uh, safety and and uh, uh, of reliability and maintenance uh, by a, a very substantial amount. We think that this is the most important element in running an airline, that nothing is more important to running an airline than safety. And you will and, never and compromise. And we will never compromise that. You can but what, what happens if you deprivatize? It, would it also still be a top priority? Because we hear that when that happens, uh, they start trying to save money and uh, mm. cutting back and things. Well, there are many ways of saving money without affecting safety. There isn't that much of an airline that actually touches on safety in terms of the total cost area. And but we I have heard that they do do that. Well, um, the, well, there have been bad experiences in the States on that, but you've given us your assurance, and I suppose we're happy about it. Next one. Go ahead from mile 108. Yeah, well, Jack, uh, I just want to say hello, and also uh, just rather make a statement rather than ask a question, but I'm uh, maybe it is a question, too. Uh, I think rather than... Uh, uh, when you said something about shares and that, did he mean that it would be uh, they'd sell shares and the government would own uh, the controlling interest, or were they saying the controlling interest would go private and then 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 the rest of the shares would be picked up by the uh, by the public or something? And and uh, and would they give it away like they did the aircraft manufacturing? Uh, uh, you know, um, the Challenger. Yeah, you know. Hold on. There are really has been no uh, no decision made by the government. It's under study. I was simply indicating that at one point in time, Air Canada will be in need of additional capital, and uh, without having to sell the airline uh, at that time, there would be a there could be a choice uh, for the government to provide that capital or to let to let the public participate in it. Yeah, that and this is really a, a speculation. I mean, it's uh, that's all it is. Go ahead from Victoria. Hi, my main question was um, in the trade magazines and the papers in the last few months. We've had, uh, we've been told that last-minute bookings for deaths in the family, um, they would, you know, people would be able to go across Canada a lot less than the thousand dollars it would cost them to go with regular economy fare. I'm just wondering when one of the airlines is going to take the uh, the bull by the horns and do something about that. It's a very difficult question it's, uh, to, to, to wrestle with, and we, uh, we in the airline industry have been, have been facing that, uh, that, that very emotional question for quite some time. It, it is, it is uh, extremely difficult to see how to make it come about right now without, uh, without uh, having abuses. Like, how do, we, how do we regulate, how do we adjust for that? I mean, because... You know, is it is it is it a, a dear friend? Is it? Uh, no, no, that's a tough one. You'd like a, to do it, but you haven't found a formula we yet. Haven't had the formula. That's right. My thanks to Pierre Geniaux, President and Chief Executive Officer of Air Canada. We'll see what the future holds. Thank you very much, Mr. Geniaux. Thank you. Very now, much. the second of the Nishka tonight is the Nishka tribal claims on land in British Columbia. So you have a better understanding of what lies ahead after the break. <laughs> Rod Robinson is chief of the Nishka Tribal Council. My memory tells me, Mr. Robinson, oh, first of all, let's look at the area involved in the Nishka. There's the Nishka, and that's a rough approximation of your territory, correct? Yes, that's correct. And it also involves uh, the international boundary as well. 
And does it involve the sea, too? Yes, part, partly. Yes. I'm going to find that this part, uh, that the boundaries do involve the sea. We'll get more of that later on. How big is the area under claim? 5,700 uh, square miles. How many Nishkas are there in, in the area, or Nishkas all over the world, who might want to claim a piece of it? Approximately 5,000. Presently, we're, we're doing a, a, uh, uh, a study to, to, to see where the Nishkas are, but up to the moment, Jack, our count is uh, approximately 5,000. Now, have you not had a successful court action involving the federal government which gave you a step forward um, over most of the Indian land claims in British Columbia? Yes, I guess you can say that we take the credit for, for the action that's going on right now. As you recall, Jack, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, when he was out west here, he, he definitely stated that he will not recognize any Aboriginal rights or, or, or title. But after the 3-3 uh, split decision in the Supreme Court, he changed his mind. But uh, I think uh, the, the opposition parties had a lot to do with it. But if you recall, at that time, Prime Minister Trudeau had a minority government. And uh, he was questioned on the floor what he was going to do about the 3-3 decision, because the highest court of the land could not resolve that. So they said, It'll, it'll now have to be a political decision. So uh, it, immediately following that, uh, the, the, the government, <coughs> the federal government changed their, their position on it. And uh, after Mr. Trudeau declared that the Indians do have certain rights after all. Now, and they put it in the Constitution. At this moment, do you have a fresh action in court seeking the title of that 5,000 square miles? Not us, but there, there are others uh, that, that are now. No. Are you now negotiating with the federal government for a, a settlement with them? Yes, we are. What kind and of settlement, if they give it, but of course they won't at the moment because the provincial government won't cooperate with them. What do you want for the Nishkas? It's well, a very elementary question because the average man in the street thinks they want everything in that 5,000 square miles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a misconception, uh, Jack. Uh, we seem to notice that prevails. Because uh, what we're doing now is we're negotiating based on certain philosophies, that of sharing and coexistence. You can interpret that down to, to percentages if, if, you, if you want to. So that's, that's what we are doing now. We're prepared to share with the rest of Canada the resources that we, we, we have not been uh, uh, beneficiaries of uh, over these years. You mean because you were trampled on when a white man came in and he arbitrarily took title and you became welfare cases of wards of the... I'm not being scurrilous, but you know what I mean. The welfare system stepped in where Indians couldn't survive by themselves. Yes, that's right. Uh, I, I guess you can say the, the European system dealt us a, a blow when they, they, they did uh, come into Canada. They, they signed certain treaties right from the east to the west, and when they got to the Rockies, they discontinued that. And so as a result of that, uh, today we feel that we, we've been victimized. We were not consulted when they arbitrarily took away our land. In fact, what they did uh, was illegal. If you look at history, the directive was before you step on the Aboriginal people's land, you must first negotiate. And they never did. They never did. And that's the reason why we were quite vocal here in British Columbia. There, there's, a, there's the absence of a treaty here in British Columbia. But you say absent treaty or no treaty, your basic rights, existing rights within the Charter, belong to you. Yes, that's correct. But when you say title, this is always the point, title. Are you the same? You want a controlled share of all the resources in your hands, or do you merely want a check every month from the resources being developed in your area? Yeah, that is to be negotiated. What, what we're saying... Or we claim 5,700 square miles, and that would be the beginning point of negotiation. And as we negotiate, there will emerge a treaty that is going to reveal the, uh, the, uh, the just and honorable claim that we, we, we're continually trying to pursue. And uh, as I say, we, 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 we're not going to be demanding the, the total 5,000 square miles. You're not going to be telling white men to get out, non-Indians no, no, to get no, out we, of your area. No, we have never said that, and we will not say that. We, no, but I'm giving yeah. you the, the concept that many people who just see a land claim headline would say. Yeah, that, that's as a result of the, the many misconceptions that's been fostered by politicians. And uh, as we, we now approach another... Uh, um, um, Watershed. 
<laughs> with with the provincial government, which says yeah. we ain't talking to you at all. That, that, That's that, what that, they say at the correct. moment. Yeah. Yeah. Can you make a deal with the feds without ever talking to the provincial government, the Van der Zams <clears throat> government? Well, let, presently we we are negotiating uh, the fi a fisheries agreement, and so far we have been doing very well with the with the feds without the province. Because but that's federal jurisdiction, that's on, federal jurisdiction on the salmon. Yeah, but somewhere along the line, the, the, the province has to get involved because they control the watershed. It's under their jurisdiction. But you don't want all the fish, do you? Because that would put a lot, an awful lot of non-Indian fishermen in welfare, wouldn't it? No, we, 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 as I said, Jack, we're negotiating what is going to be ours with certainty. That I think that seems to be the ultimate objective of these negotiations, is that we obtain certainty. What is going to be your share? What is going to be the share of the uh, of the non-native? And you, you, we are quite aware and we are quite sensitive about third-party interests, Jack. Who because be the third party are the majority by far. I mean, yeah. you're outnumbered a thousand to one. Yeah, we realize that. And who would be better qualified to to have a sense of feeling for the third-party interest than us? No one looked after my my ancestors' third party interest when they arbitrarily took over the land. So oh, but they didn't. I mean, your, your ancestors <coughs> didn't suffer from the vast industrial pollution or logging or the necessity to maintain a population of a couple of million people. No, but, but they destroyed a way of life. Can you bring it back, though, that way of life? I mean, or would you not, said he, to be brutally frank, be as bad as anybody else? When the log market is good, cut the trees and ship them overseas. Would you not tend to do that for material affluence the same as the somewhat greedy yes, non-Indian yes, does. Yes, we, we would do that. that, that that's being businesslike. But what, what I'm talking about, we were now in, encouraged by the government, OK, why don't you people get off the welfare and go back trapping, go back hunting? What can we do when, when, the, when the habitat of the fur-bearing animals has been destroyed and there's no more animals? Could there? you have done any better? Oh, yes, we, we could have done. Because we have the proper, Jack, we have the proper philosophy to manage because our philosophy is is slightly different than yours because the, the European concept of, uh, of, of management is you, the, the land is there for you to, to, uh, to exploit. But our, it, our belief is that we are a part of nature, therefore we have to live in harmony with nature. Can you do this without wrecking our economic structure? That's oh, that, what that, many that, people that, worry about. There is nothing impossible under the sun. You have to think of the future. Right now, the, the, uh, the uh, economic objectives of, of, uh, of the people seem to be too short-sighted. Ours is, 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 is more, we're looking more into the horizon, we're looking more into the future. But we've got to raise money for the unemployment insurance. You know how bad things are in British Columbia at the moment? I'm aware because uh, most of my people, about 95% of my people, are unemployed. So I'm, we're quite aware of this. Would you like to see the end of the Indian Affairs people? Well, uh, right now, Jack, that, that's another thing that we're negotiating. We, my personal belief is this, that, that we're, they're spending too much money on administration, and yet we now have at attained a level, some expertise among our ranks, that we can do the job just as well as they do. My thanks indeed to Rod Robinson, Chief of the Nishka Tribal Council. I'll be back after break. <laughs> Hope you're enjoying the, the Land Claim series, because tomorrow night you're going to meet, at the end of the program, Neil Stirrett of the Kitscan. Uh, we're also going to have uh, a very serious one with Barry Sullivan on his report to the government about sexual abuse in schools, what caused it, and what they're going to do about it. And thirdly, for you kind of nutty people, we're going to have a vitamin guru, American's number one vitamin expert. And I ain't big on vitamins, but I take my B12 every day. Tomorrow, 5 p.m., stay tuned for the news hour.